When Johan Cruyff died in 2016, the football world mourned, and none more than two clubs, Ajax and FC Barcelona. As a player, he helped catapult Ajax into what was historically a top side in the Netherlands into one of the top sides in world football, at least for a few years. He did this as a player whose brilliance and understanding of the game ushered in total football and reshaped the game as we know it. At Barcelona, he pushed the envelope as a player, helping to bring Barca back from the dark ages, but not totally yet into the light. That would come more than a decade later with him in charge, when Barcelona established itself as one of the elite teams in European football. But maybe his greatest influence on the Catalan club came with the ideas that he instilled in others, the counsel he gave to Juan Laporta, the tutelage he provided to Pep Guardiola, and the unwavering principles that destroyed relationships, divided a fan base, and helped build one of the greatest teams ever assembled. It is the summertime, and I have to be honest, transfers get me a bit tired. So I was thinking about content to do for the channel, and somehow I realized we have gone years, and I do mean years, without really talking about Johan Cruyff. Here and there we've done a little bit, of course you can't talk about the Dream Team without him, you can't talk about the 1970s without him as a player, but really focusing on just Johan Cruyff and the impact he had at FC Barcelona. And I especially don't want to talk about Cruyff through the lens of Crisismo, and the ways in which his words have been contorted to create different factions in the fan base. If you feel like you're divided as to where you stand on this video, then I'm not sure you got the point of this video. This is merely an explainer about Johan Cruyff, about the nuances and difficulties of him as the man, on the reasons we deify him, and the reasons why we have to understand why his role was what it was in his waning years. And while I don't have a coupon code or a sponsorship, this video and all the research done would not have been possible without this handy dandy book by Simon Cooper and the book My Turn, which is his own, that being Johann Cruyff's own autobiography. These two books really help guide my research as to what I'm going to present to you today. So let's get started, but I guess not with Johann Cruyff's story, because Cruyff's story actually starts with Venus Michaels, one of his first coaches at Ajax. Before Michaels, Ajax was playing in a 4-2-4 under Vic Buckingham, a regular formation at the time. But with Michaels in charge and Cruyff the leader on the field, they switched to a 4-3-3 and total football was kind of born. And I don't want to oversimplify total football, but many of its tactics, which include a goalkeeper that could pass, a bit of pressing, and most significantly, versatility amongst its players who could swap positions on the field whenever necessary, are all still very prevalent in the expectations Kool-Aid's and most top fan bases expect of their teams. At this point, I should mention that Cruyff wasn't a one-man team either. The likes of Johan Niskins, a top 50 player for Barcelona and a top 10 player for Ajax, and Yuri Mirren in the midfield. Horst Blankenberg as a center back that was ahead of his time, and goalkeeper Hein Stoy. The freedom and fluidity of the team revolved around Cruyff. He wanted space when attacking, make things wide and attack the space the opposition leaves while defending sideline to sideline. But when defending, snuff out space as fast as possible. Even in his athletic prime, Cruyff was never an elite athlete. He wasn't the quickest or the strongest in a time when the game was prioritizing those things more than any other. And in fact, he was actually a heavy chain smoker. He would smoke and smoke and smoke, not stopping until after his playing career was over when he was already a manager and had a bit of a health scare. So obviously cardio as a player was not his cup of tea. Though what he was the best at was his close control, technical ability, and of course his mind, which was the greatest weapon in the game. And that technical skill in particular was refined from a young age under the watchful eye of the club Ajax. He grew up in the shadow of the stadium, and his father was a huge fan of the club. And unfortunately, his father Manos did die while Cruyff was just 12 years old due to a heart attack. Now, it's difficult to find silver lines with such bad news at such a young age, but it did fuel in Cruyff a desire not only not to lose, but a desire to provide for a future family and make sure that there was no quit in his bones. And while there was some stability added, his mother did take on additional jobs, and she did marry the groundsman, in which Cruyff grew up knowing at Ajax and the grounds crew. But shifting focus back to Venus Michaels, he wasn't necessarily typically a father figure, but Cruyff does credit a number of men with sprinkling little bits of fatherly wisdom throughout his youth. It was the aforementioned Vic Buckingham, who Kules may know as also a manager of FC Barcelona in the past, who gave Cruyff at 17 years old his Ajax debut. But it was under Michaels that he really became the Johan Cruyff that we know at the ripe old age of 18. Michaels gave Cruyff the freedom to thrive as a player. But this freedom always came at a price. The two always talked tactics and always argued. But they both also thrived in conflict, which is why they worked so well together. Stefan Kovacs, who replaced Michaels at Ajax after Michaels took a bigger money move to Barca, gave the players even more freedom and they kept on winning. 
But all good IX things did come to an end. And it's at this point in the video when I want to remind you that Johann Cruyff is not just some ethereal idea or figurehead or genius that exists only in the clouds, but he was a living, breathing person with a personality, and a personality that was both his greatest asset and his Achilles heel. He first came to Barcelona after being stripped of the captaincy at Ajax. Well, not necessarily stripped, but he lost the vote to continue being captain in July of 1973 and called his agent in the hallway to get him to Barcelona. Then he came to Barcelona, and aside from what he was actually doing as a player on the field, here comes the most difficult part to understand of his legacy. And that's what he represented to Catalonia and the Catalan people, regardless of whether he wanted to or not. For starters, he was willing to move to a dictatorship, especially for the money. In May of 1973, foreign players were able to play in Spain again, and it was time to go. This was partly because he wanted to live in Barcelona, but it was a lot about money. The tax rates in Spain compared to the Netherlands circa the 1970s, if you could, you did. But then came a few events that endeared him to the Catalans. Firstly, Cruyff refused Madrid's contract offer somewhat due to Ajax accepting it, and Barca spent a world record transfer fee on him, a fee so high that he was registered as livestock to circumvent import regulations. He said in 1974 that he didn't want to be involved in politics, but his presence and anti-authoritarian nature made him more of a figurehead for Catalan nationalism than he actually was. And while he wasn't involved in politics, his confrontational nature with the refs that Barca fans believed were owned by the capital was inherently political, even if it wasn't meant to be by Cruyff. But part of me certainly thinks he knew something of what he was doing. And then there was Jordi. The story goes that he wanted to name his son Jordi, but not doing so after the patron saint of Catalonia, but because he and his wife Danny liked the name. It became some kind of legend about him convincing the clerk at the town hall to let him be named Jordi instead of Jorge, as a Catalan version Jordi was banned at the time. Then, eight days later, the 5-0 at the Bernabeu happened, creating El Clasico as we know it, and forever making Cruyff a Catalan idol. And at this point, we should say, that was the playing highlight for Barcelona and Johan Cruyff, as they won the league that season, the only one Cruyff would win with Barcelona. Because by that time, Cruyff's time at Barcelona was already coming to its end. A threat for one of Josep Luis Nunez's opponents, not Nunez himself, but his opponents, led to him being elected, and it was one of Cruyff's, we'll say, final acts as a Barcelona player. Financial issues forced him to continue playing in both the U.S. and the Netherlands for the next few years, where he was both physically past it but still a walking legend, especially around young Ajax players Ronald Koeman, Frank Rijkaard, and Marco van Basten. In 1984, he retired as a player at Feyenoord, having fallen out with Ajax after a money dispute, but did return to be Ajax's coach in 1985. The first and one of the most lasting things he did was change every academy team and the first team to play in a 4-3-3, then move up the field and shift into a 3-4-3 as these main principles would exist from the U10 all the way to the first team. Because now it's time to return to Barcelona, and Johan Cruyff's time as the manager of the Catalan club. He returned in 1988, and while Nunez reportedly didn't like him very much, it was a union that helped them both, as it did when Nunez became president originally. And it should be noted that Cruyff wasn't a complete loner either. Credit should be given to Paco Cerullo, nicknamed El Drudia, who was Cruyff's fitness man and brought his ideas from the handball section at Barca. It was fitness with the ball, the type of fitness that would be relevant during the game. As well as longtime assistant Tony Bruin Slot, a man who was able to fill in any possible gap in tactics or analysis of the opponent that Cruyff might have missed. And finally, old Barca teammate Charlie Rusak, who was another assistant, who fell out with Cruyff when Rusak took over for him after he was let go, mirroring the breakdown between Guardiola and Villanova years later. One of his big moves, something that Xavi would hope that he would have the same chance to do before he's let go as Barca manager, was to bring in players to spice the team up. In particular, Cruyff looked to the Basque region to spice the team up and give the team a bit of a mentality shift, as they were known to be a little more hard-nosed, especially in the 1980s, up there in the northern region of Spain. He took chances on players whose physicality was questioned, just like his own, with the best example being a too skinny Guardiola. And his most important three words as manager of Barca came in 1992, Salid y disfrutad, go out and enjoy it, before being Sampdoria for their first European Cup at Wembley, having lost to Stau Bucharest in 1986 and having a list of almost throughout their history. Four straight La Ligas came next. And then a 4-0 lashing from AC Milan in 1994 in the Champions League final. Not only was it his lowest point at Barcelona as a manager, but it obviously led eventually to him leaving in 1996. And now for part three, I think we need to finish up by really focusing on how he was the architect of modern football and modern Barcelona. Some of Cruyff's core beliefs were, and let's list them, 
To receive the ball facing the right way with your head up to better see the field, looking for players regardless of their size, instead looking for players with the technical skill set we're laying out, looking to the academy to reinforce the squad when necessary, trusting that coming up through the academy means that those players are best prepared for the first team from day one. Find the triangles, set up in rest defense in a staggered way, so that one player losing the ball wouldn't mean that a whole line of players was beaten. Rondos and the concentration required for it was essential to improve a player and figure out who had it and who didn't. He wanted defenders that attacked. Look at Koeman's goals at Barcelona, the roles that Albert Soler and Sergio Bazouan played for the Dream Team. And finally, press high. Press high, press high, hunting the opposition when the ball is turned over. And his influence over these points were very much around the Barca and Torno, a term that he actually made up in his later years. Even after he was gone as manager, his voice was still heard pretty loudly around Barcelona, be it through his column in the newspaper or through people getting stuff to the press. There's a good argument that the tug of war in his later years, in the media in particular, is what led to the different factions within the club. But as was always the case with Cruyff, and what I can defend him with, is that he was the one to take the burden of, well, fault, if you will say. But the only time that Johan Cruyff was ever in conflict with someone is when someone else was in conflict with him. It was always a two-way street. So to try to pin blame or put it all on Johan Cruyff is pretty unfair when you look at the other side. Cruyff lived in Barcelona until his death in 2016, but still served as a counsel for Juan Laporta, a fan of Cruyff when he became president. Cruyff gave the thumbs up to Rijkaard as manager, Bajira Stein as technical director, and Pep as manager. All very wise decisions in hindsight. But it was in 2010 when Senator Rosell became president, a man Cruyff did not like. Let me emphasize that. Did not like. And Cruyff's direct link to Barcelona was severed. The reputations of Rosell and Bartomeu have further pushed the idea that Cruyff may have made a lot of wrong choices about people. Yes, but he did get some major ones right. So with all we've gone over, what's the takeaway for today's Barcelona? The one that has strayed a bit from what Cruyff built, but through the familiar faces of Laporta, Jordi Cruyff, Xavi, and the like, Barcelona is at least in theory striving to get back to those roots. And the lasting legacy for Cruyff is maybe Barca's biggest problem at the moment. He didn't just establish Barca's way, he established the way that any elite team in modern football is going to play. It isn't necessarily about not having athletes or not wanting to play by the blueprint that Cruyff and Guardiola and Villanova and yes, even Koeman and Xavi laid out. It's that the secret sauce that made Barca what it is now is being replicated everywhere. So many of Cruyff's principles are the principles of the modern game. So the teams with the right talent and deep enough pockets are able to put together teams that very idealistically represent what Cruyff was putting forward. And that's even Real Madrid today. Yes, even Real Madrid. That's the primary reason why Aurelian Chuamani is probably going to Real Madrid. But kool have watched him understand that he would also be a perfect fit at the Camp No. Last things last, I didn't speak about Meske Un Club at all in this video. But that motto connects to Cruyff in profound ways and is definitely a video for another time. And in typical Johan Cruyff fashion, I gotta take this last, last moment to remind you that you can also be at the cutting edge of fashion like Cruyff was in the 70s in some Barcelona podcast gear. It's available at the store, which you can find down in the link below. And you know, I usually wrap each and every one of these videos up with an old Forza Barca. But this time, Salid y Disfrutad.